On the recent uh, world tour, you did about, I think, half and half, half post Beatles and half Beatles material. What was, the, what made you finally decide, yeah, I'm going to put a healthy dose of this material into my act? Um, it was time, really. The reason all of us in the Beatles shied away from Beatles material directly after the breakup was that I think we all thought we've got to try and prove to ourselves that there's life after the Beatles. You know, because it's not easy to have been Charlie Chaplin and then want to branch out into a, a serious career because, mm -hmm. you know, even he had problems with that. You know, people still preferred the charming little cheeky tramp, you know. And so we all had that problem to try and overcome. So we all shied away from Beatle material as a way of doing it. Um, but time, you know, so much time has gone by. It's now kind of 20 years since we made that decision. And um, I just thought when I was thinking about the tour, I just thought if I was going to his show, you know, uh, imagining myself as a, an audience member, what would I like to hear him do? And the inevitable songs come in, you know, like, hey, Jude, it'd be good. Well, how about Sergeant Pepper? Well, hey, could he do uh, yesterday or she's leaving home or whatever? So we, we left some, quite a few out. But um, I just thought, yeah, you know, there's enough water gone under the bridge. Um, there's no painful memories. Near the, the breakup, it was just painful. You're just singing something with so many memories. It's like, I likened it uh, later to kind of like singing the ex-wife songs when you've had a divorce. Yeah. No way, buddy. Ooh, you know, no way. Is she going to catch me doing that one? You know, so, um, you know, we all made that decision independently to do that. But I say there was enough time gone by, so I just thought, well, it might be good to do them. So we started rehearsing them, and it was great fun because I hadn't done them for so long, been keeping, uh, just steering clear of them. Yeah. Suddenly I was able to kind of sing Hey Jude after millions of years. I really enjoyed it. Sergeant Pepper, I'd never, I'd never ever done that. Only on the vocal take. You see, that's what people the forget. Record. After the San Francisco concert, I guess around 66, mm. the Beatles are a studio band. And maybe some sure. early rock videos, as we would call them now through the through the rearview mirror, but mm. Sergeant Pepper, Hey Jude, Get Back, those have never been performed in concert. That's right, you know, we never did them. So, so it was great to rediscover them because they were actually fresher than my contemporary material, because I'd been doing that. Suddenly there were these kind of songs that are really nice to do, that was the other decision. I mean, if you've got Hey Jude, you can get the crowd going, nah, yeah. nah, 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 and it's great, you know, and you've got like, uh, you know, 60,000 people doing that. It's a, it's a, great, uh, I, a great thing to do you find, maybe to your surprise, moved you the most while you performed it on stage? Um, I think it really the only thing that really happened, because most of the time uh, you don't get, I don't get that moved, because I'm, I'm thinking of words. You know, mm -hmm. it's like an actor in a very sort of dramatic part. You're really thinking of your next line, you're trying to remember where I walk next. You know, there's a lot of that goes on, uh, even, in a, even in a music show. So, you don't get that involved, but there, there, was, there was one moment really in Hey Jude, because um, I hadn't done it for so long, there's one line that always reminded me of John, and that used to get me kind of emotional, you know, when it would creep up on me and sort of catch me on a worse. There was a line, uh, the movement you need is on your shoulder, which when I was playing John the song, I, I basically sort of wrote that one, I, on the tour I kind of do the, my Beatles songs, you know. So I was playing John this song when I, when I wrote it, and um, I'm going, you know, hey, June, and he's going, yeah, yeah. And I said, the movement you need is on your shoulder. I said, I'll be changing that. You know, it's stupid, you know, it sounds like a parrot. And he said, you won't, you know. He said, it's a bloody great line. I said, no, that's stupid. The movement you need is on your shoulder. What does that mean? He said, I know what it means. He said, that's probably the best line in it, man. So I said, great, you know, and when you've got a collaborator like John, you leave it in, you know, because if he says it's great, it's great. It's like, you know, if I, I insist on a line in one of his songs, I could persuade him. We can persuade each other, we respect each other's opinion. So when I got to that line occasionally, the movement you need is on your shoulder, you know, and it, it was quite occasionally a, a bit emotional to sort of sing that. You said in a Playboy interview that's probably more than a decade old now, that all of you, and maybe especially you, because you were the primary collaborator, coveted John's approval. Mm. And you were quoted as saying he was the oldest, which is indisputable. No, but... it isn't. He wasn't. 
Ringo was the oldest. But he was the older, of the, I guess, of the two of the you. The older. The older, right. That's correct. That is correct. The, let's get the chain let's of progression here. Let's get the old here. thing here, you know. Old, older, Ringo, oldest. very old. <laughs> John, senile. Me, ancient, but a little less ancient. No, go ahead. So anyway, yeah. and also quoted as saying that he was the smartest and the quickest wit. Were yeah. you being kind or was that true? No, I, 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 I certainly think that was true. I certainly think John was the quickest wit. That, that was, it, there was no doubt about that, no contest. Um, he, it, that was definitely true. Um, I, and we did covet his, uh, you know, respect, his, his attention and stuff. Uh, I think, you know, having said that, I wouldn't mind betting he coveted ours. You know, we don't think of that. You never know. I just know what I felt. I don't know what he felt. And John was not very forthcoming about what he felt. He, he was quite a private person, and you'd, you'd only ever see it in tiny little instances, you know, that he, that he, I remember once, I mean, one, you know, one of the things I remember about John was silly little things. You don't remember all the great big moments, they just went by in a flash, you know, meeting the Queen, hi there, whew, gone, you know. But you remember stupid little things. I remember we were kind of, kind of arguing once about something musical or something. I remember John just kind of taking his glasses down and sort of saying, it's only me, and putting them back up again. Um, you know, so, so maybe he did have uh, similar feelings towards us that we had to him. But he, he just uh, didn't make it uh, perhaps as obvious. But uh, we, we were Lennon fans, definitely, you know. He, he was a great guy. You were an ex-Beatle by the time you were 29. So this extraordinary rush of worldwide fame and extraordinary experiences that happened to you and John Lennon as very young men. And ever since that time, people, some with knowledge, some without knowledge, have speculated about the nature of that collaboration, the nature of that relationship. What sense are you able to make of it now? Well, you know, I think in life it's not that easy to uh, analyze your relationships with people. Um, not just John. I, I think with, with anyone it's, it's not that easy. And as you say, when, there's, when fame's in there uh, as, as one of the factors, it can get even more complicated. But um, I always feel quite lucky having a, I, I had a really great family in Liverpool. I had great parents and I have uh, quite a secure childhood. I never realized it at the time, but talking to someone like John later and hearing about his childhood when his father left home when he was three and things like that, you know, boy, I don't know what I'd have done if that had happened to me. So, so I, uh, I think that helped me just uh, to sort things out and to sort relationships out, just my kind of Liverpool upbringing, because um, they were pretty much feet on the ground people and very earthy people I come from, you know, so if there's any bull going around, it gets found out fairly quickly, you know, so mm -hmm. I've got, I think I've got a good antenna for that. It's easy to see how these images take hold. Uh, even sitting here talking to you, a man I hadn't met until half an hour ago, you're accessible, you're open. John seemed to have more of an air of danger and people equate that with an artistic mm. temperament. Mm. And so the easy compartments happen. Mm. Paul's the melody maker. Mm. John's the artistic soul mm. of the Beatles. And people forget that, yeah, Paul wrote Yesterday, and he wrote The Long and Winding Road, but he also wrote Helter Skelter, and mm. Why Don't We Do It in the Road. He wrote Day Tripper. You know, mm. does it, how mm. much does it bother you still that people don't have the full picture? Uh, it doesn't really bother me too much. You know, I, it's a natural thing that happens that. I was actually just talking to someone before about that. I think the only way I could get the kind of edge John had would be to have a different childhood. And I certainly wouldn't have wished for that. You know, John had a real bad time in his childhood. As I say, you know, he, his father left home when he was three. Uh, his mother didn't, his mother lived with someone down the road. He didn't live with his mother, although he idolized her. He lived with his aunt and uncle. Then the uncle died. John started to think he's got a jinx. And he, any men he lives with leave rather suddenly. And I think John was a very frightened person about that. His first marriage didn't work out. So he, he had a lot of pain, you know, um, inside himself that I didn't have. So, I mean, the only alternative for me is to wish for a painful life, which I'm not going to do. You know, uh, I, I, if, if that's what I require to be a great artist, then I don't want to be a great artist. Maybe then the best situation is not to have to live the life, but to have him there as a sounding board. To well, have I him think that was what was the great thing. Have you know. both of you kind and, of... And, you know, you have to remember me as a sounding board for John, sure. you know, because uh, that is the thing I say to people, you know, if, look, uh, if John had thought that I was rubbish, 
he didn't suffer fools gladly. I, I, he wouldn't have worked with me as long as we did. We wouldn't have been able to do what we did if he didn't. We enjoyed it. We sat down. We really enjoyed each other's company. We are really good for each other, too. Um, because John, as you say, was more the sort of acid wit, the sort of... I mean, I was writing the song, um, a song off Sergeant Pepper. Uh, and it, it, John, it was always great this way. You know, I was, I was writing the song, and he's sitting by the side. He had a guitar, I was on piano. I'm going, it's getting better all the time. And he's going, it couldn't get much worse. <laughs> and you go, oh, get it down. You know, that's fantastic. You know, and I say, I don't care what people think or how they analyze it. Um, I think if John was here now, I don't think he'd say he was the only one in the Beatles or that he was the soul of the Beatles. I think he'd admit that it was a pretty uh, equal affair, really. But, um, you know, having said that, he was great. And I'm, I'm more than proud to have worked with someone like him. It was, a, it was a great experience, you can imagine. I've read, and we all hope it's true, that you more or less reconciled before he was shot. Yeah, that was, that was really the great thing about the whole thing, because I don't think George did. Uh, you know, we were often having arguments around about that time. Um, and, you know, business things, and you'd sort of ring up and we'd shout at each other and slam the phone down, you know, and uh, it got pretty difficult. But very luckily, I think, uh, a couple of months before he, he died, we'd got really some good conversations on the phone. I'd just be ringing him. It was around about the time when he was doing um, role reversal with Yoko. He was a house husband. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, John did that for a little while. So I remember ringing him and I was saying, you know, what's happening? What are you doing? He said, well, I'm just padding around here in my robe. I've just put the cats out. I'm just going to make some bread. And I've got the washing up to do, love. Oh, dear me, a woman's work is never done, you know. That was great. So I can relate to all that. You know, that's just good old stuff. I, and, and it was great to relate to John on, on that kind of level, which, which I find very easy. So we really did. We reconciled and we were talking very friendly to, to each other. As I say, I'm not sure, but I think uh, George may have a slight regret that I don't know whether he did get that conversation in. Uh, listen, I mean, you know, whether he did or not, he knows John loved him. I mean, we, we you know, for all our craziness, we, we loved each other. We were, we, were, we were real good buddies. But that's the way that good buddies, you know, they, they occasionally hate each other. It's the way of any great love affair or any family or anything. It's not all roses. Uh, you don't need me to tell you this, but I guess for the benefit of the audience, then to get your reaction. If somebody didn't, mixed in with it all, genuinely love somebody, genuinely care about their feelings about them, they wouldn't go to the lengths, in whatever strange way, that John did to lash back at you. They wouldn't hold a pig on the cover to parody you holding a sheep and ram. They wouldn't, you know, call your stuff rubbish or write how do you sleep. They wouldn't do it. No, I think that's right. You know, I think that's right. I think he was, he was very hurt. Uh, there were people turning him against me. Uh, it was his way of defending himself. He was, he was quite pissed off about the McCartney bandwagon, as he once called it. You know, oh, bloody, you know, he's getting on all the telly, he's getting, he's selling records. Um, you know, he was, he, he was a jealous guy, you know. But um, I understood that. That's, that. That was John. You love it or you leave it. And I stuck with it for many, many years. and and. I think we would have all continued the Beatles, but Yoko came along. John fell wildly in love with her. He needed a big, big change in his life, and he got it. You know, he came to live in New York. He kind of threw over all his English um, contacts and everything. And, and, you know, you can't blame him. That's what he wants to do in his life. So we, we had to kind of uh, fade into the background to allow them to have their relationship. What are we going to do, ringing him up? Hey, John, you know, hey, come and see me. Leave Yoko. You know, I mean, yeah. that was obviously never going to happen. Um, so you, you had to let him do what he wanted, you know, and uh, he, he did, you know, and he enjoyed it. How often did you walk around and a, a melody or some kind of snippet of a thought went through your head and you said, that's better for John's voice, or this would be good if the two of us could work on it together? Well, that still happens, obviously, you know. Uh, you get an idea which is sort of Lennon-esque, then you can't help thinking, you know, and particularly me who's worked with him so much, you can't help thinking, boy, you know, we could really develop this one. Unfortunately, I now have to just do it my way, uh, as the man said. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, which is okay. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, great, sure, if John was here, I'd much prefer to develop them with, with him, but uh, I don't have that luxury. Speaking of my way, that segues into the next thing. I think Sinatra once did something 
which of course was George Harrison's George, yeah. uh, song. Mm. Um, I think he announced it as my favorite Lennon McCartney song too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Frank. <laughs> Okay. And didn't Ella Fitzgerald do All You Need Is Love? Or she did Can't Buy Me Love. Can't Buy Me Love, okay. And, and Otis Redding put Day Tripper into, into one of his sets. The point I'm getting to is there are probably hundreds of thousands of Beatle covers. Mm. Which ones do you like the best? And which ones do you say, please, no, I'll buy it back from no, you? I'm not telling you those ones, because the artists are probably still around. But um, the ones I love, there's a Roy Redmond version of Good Day Sunshine. It's not really known by many people. I love that. I like Ray Charles's Eleanor Rigby. I, I tend to like the uh, black versions, just because I like black vocalists, you know, and I like what they do with the song and they funk it up a bit, you know. And it's always, uh, plus it's a great honor, you know, for a kid like me who started off totally idolizing an, a record like What Did I Say by Ray Charles. Yeah. To have him do my song, I mean, you know, that's, that's something special. Stevie Wonder, we can work it out. There's some <laughs> which is funny, actually, I mean, I don't know if it's anything to do with it, but I know when we met Bob Dylan years later, you know the bit in the middle that goes, um, I can't hide, I can't hide, I can't hide, woo, oh, you. He's saying, oh, man, he said, I thought that was, I get high, I get high, I get high. <laughs> so maybe that was something to do with saying, no, Bob, you know, it's I can't hide. I don't know, you know, it's, um, it was just caught the imagination, I think, that record. Suddenly then all the others got interested, uh, you know, uh, She Loves You became a hit all over again, They Loves Me Do. We ended up with, like, the top five at one point. See, even that early stuff, before you can see the clear departure into more artistic material, before Revolver, before Rubber Soul, when the break becomes very clear, if you look back on that early stuff, it's not just the freshness. There were some clever things done there and different things done there that people didn't recognize because they were concentrating on the fashion, they were mm -hmm. concentrating on the hysteria, but even starting a song like She Loves You with the chorus. Think about a thousand rock and roll records. I can't think of any that start with the chorus no. like that one did. It's just different. Come right in with the hook. I mean, you guys had that. I, I heard you say to somebody, uh, maybe in a moment of immodesty, you were a little cleverer than everybody yeah, else around. A moment of immodesty, yeah, uh, that's right. Now, um, it is difficult to kind of talk about that without really seeming, you know, big-headed. But we, we were slightly different. It wasn't so much cleverer, really. That's kind of the wrong word. It was, we were slightly more artsy. We were a little bit more like an art group. Um, for instance, we, we did a waltz. There was, there was a James Ray. There was a guy called James Ray. And we, we had his album, and he, he had this little song, uh, If You've Got to Make a Fool of Somebody. Now, nobody was doing waltzes. But we'd, we'd just do this. We, we tried to be, go for the B-sides of records, lesser-known songs. And our whole repertoire was made up of quite weird songs because of that. So it did make us different. And... Um, I think, you know, with, with me having uh, gone to a, a grammar school and got a, a couple of exams and stuff, done reasonably well, with John having gone to an art school, George went to the same school as I did too, and Ringo went to school for three days. He was something else. <laughs> but he was a quick study. <laughs> he was a, boy, was he a quick study. That's another story. He was ill a lot when he was a kid. Uh, but um, I think it did give us a little bit of a different attitude, you know, a sort of slightly wittier attitude with someone like John. I mean, we were asked for, uh, somebody said, how did the group start? And instead of sort of, you know, saying, um, the group started when uh, the boys got together at Wilton Town Hall in 19... Uh, John sort of started, away. we got a vision on, you know, a man came to us on a bun <laughs> and we had a vision. You know, it, it was always like that. We developed this little thing in Europe. We'd, we'd developed, because we'd started to get contact with the press and so we'd started to sort of realize the game here. You know, if you wanted to get invited back, you had to say something, yeah. you know. So um, I say, and John was particularly good. And Ringo was very good at that, too. He always had a little answer, you know. He's, he's got a funny guy. A lot of people would say, if you had to pick one album, Sgt. Pepper's The Album, it, would that jive with your own assessment, or is that more because it was a cultural impact and wasn't maybe as good musically? Um... I don't, I don't really make any differenti differentiation between um, the albums. I, I kind of think for the time and for the musical knowledge we had, each one's got something special. I probably would choose Sgt. Pepper myself because uh, I had a lot to do with it. Um, that was your idea, sort of alter well, ego band, I mean, right? Know, you know, it was my, that was my idea. But um, it wasn't entirely my idea, but yeah, to, 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 to 
get us away from being the Beatles, I had this idea that we should pretend we were another group. And it, it took hold, you know, even down to getting costumes made and everything. Um, I think yeah, I'd probably choose that if I had to, but I, I wouldn't want to really. I'd prefer to sort of have each one for, for what they meant at the time. You know, Abbey Road is a nice album. Um, Revolver's a nice album. Rubber Soul's a nice album. Uh, so I, I wouldn't like to choose really, but if I had to, I'd probably, you know, on a desert island, I'd probably take Sgt. Pepper with me. It stands up. It's still a very uh, crazy album. It still sounds crazy even now, after all these years. And you would think that it would have really dated and that stuff since it would, would, would sound so much more modern. But I don't think it does. Um, some of that stuff really sound, sounds pretty wacky still. I'll ask you only one question like this because you're probably tired of hearing it in one form or another. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious that you guys uh, reflected your time and helped to shape it. But what do you think is the lasting meaning of the Beatles if there's, if there's a meaning to be taken from this? All you need is love. Should I elaborate? If you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, after the 60s, that was kind of looked on as a bit sort of stupid. You know, hey, all you need is love, dude. You know, well, you need more. You know, we need weapons and we need defense or whatever, you know, which is also true. But it's, it's coming back. It keeps rolling back, this idea that what these people on this planet need is love, you know. And I think that was our message. I always say to people, you know, we could have we had a really uh, satanic message. And with the power we had, boy, you know, we could have made quite a difference the other way. But we always chose not to do that. Nobody was remotely interested in that. We had this idea that all you need is love. Do it. In the and end, I the still love, believe it. In the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. That's your song. That kind of thing, you know. I still think that that's true. I think the idea gets knocked every so often because, you know, it's a violent world and that you do need other things. But I still think that's the, uh, that's the message. What do you think are the best songs you've done on your own? And I went back before I did this interview and listened to some wing stuff. And some of it people take pot shots at. Mm. And I don't like all of it as well as I like no. the earlier stuff with the Beatles. Mm. But if I were to pick the 10 or 12 best wing songs, I, I certainly wouldn't be ashamed to throw those out on a compilation album. No, you know, album. The, the thing about Wings was that uh, we, lived, we, we, all, we did everything we did in the shadow of the Beatles legend. So we never thought we were successful at all with Wings. We always just thought we were, we were you know, never producing anything good, really. But I think, looking back on it, like you're saying, I think Maybe I'm Amazed um, was a reasonable song and something I would have been quite proud to do in the I think the, there are a few songs, you know, you can't get it all right. And obviously, faced with, a, with a, an uphill battle, which it was to, to perform in a group after you're known as the Beatles, you know, um, I think we did really well, you know, um, you know relatively speaking. And uh, in fact, I'd, certain albums I always thought were terrible bummers. I'd looked them up in the charts and they were kind of number eight in America or something, you know. Okay, that's not number one, but boy, it's not bad. You know? So, um, you know, I, I think there are certain few songs there that still hold up. When will you tour again? Probably next year. This must be a great kick for you, because as I understand it, like you said earlier, you wanted to keep on with the Beatles, and not the least of which of the reasons was you wanted to go back and perform, maybe in smaller venues. And, mm. you know, a lot of those Beatles performances after you hit, they weren't really concerts as much as they were cultural events. You probably mm -hmm. couldn't even hear yourselves mm -hmm. on stage. So now you get a chance to perform again. That, that has to mean a lot to you. Yeah, I like performing. You know, I'm some kind of a ham. Um, I don't like just sitting at home twiddling my thumbs, you know, or just being in the studio all the time. There's something about the feedback from a live audience that is, that is very special. Uh, you, you make a record in, in a closet kind of thing. Uh, it gets released. You, you see it go up the charts if you're lucky, but, but you don't see the whites of anybody's eyes. You just see figures and you see accountants talking to you about how you did. When you get out on tour, there's people. Hey, I remember you. And, you know, you can see the first 30 rows and you kind of relate to them. Hey, who have we got in tonight? You know, that looks like a nice looking couple over there. <laughs> and I enjoy that. I mean, it's, I'm that kind of a person, you know. I like to get out and, and, uh, and also, obviously, the applause is something you don't get when you do a record. I think we're all pretty insecure as, as humans. I think, you know, we've all got quite a good uh, dollop of insecurity. Uh, you know, I, th I figure if I have, then, you know, and I've done so much, I shouldn't.
be insecure at all. So if I've got it, I figure most people have got it. Um, I think it can help. A bit of applause can help. You sort of think, hey, yeah. you know, it's like, uh, was it uh, Sally Fields came on the Oscars? Right, you, you, you like, you love me, you know. It's that, it's that one, you know. It's, uh, you hope they'll like you. If you actually do a concert and they applaud and they, you can see someone, you see a fully grown man crying, you figure, well, he probably liked it. Right now there's a film about uh, the world tour of a year ago called Get Back. And of course there was a live album made out of uh, various concerts from that tour. But is there a new studio album in the works now? Yeah, there's, I'm, I've just written a new album. Um, and uh, we go, in a couple of weeks we'll go in the studio and start working on that with the band, basically the same band that was on the world tour but with a different drummer. I didn't realize that you wrote at least a substantial part of When I'm 64 when you were 16. I wrote the tune then, yeah. That was in the days, it was actually kind of pre-rock and roll. Nobody can, and nobody, the kids now can't imagine a time when there wasn't rock and roll. But um, it was just before that, so it was kind of, you know, we were looking to kind of interest people like Sinatra rather than do rock and roll, you know. So I did this little da 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 and then the words came later. But uh, yeah, I wrote the tune when I was quite young. So now you're closer to age 64 than you were either when you wrote the tune or when the whole thing came together and was Thanks a lot. released. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I love this guy. <laughs> yeah, no, that is true. I have to own up to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm fast approaching 50 next year. Um, but, you know, hey, we're all getting there one way or another. Can you see yourself performing? Into your 50s, into your 60s? I don't know. I don't know. I didn't think, no, I didn't think I'd be performing when I was 30. You know, I thought it would be very unseemly to be jiggling around on a stage at that age, that great age. Now that looks very young, 30. I see people approaching 30 and they say, oh my God, you know, I don't know how I'm going to handle it. Don't worry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah, I could be performing when I'm 90, you know, but the songs will be very slow, I think, by then. <laughs> Interesting uh, irony in that you own the, the publishing rights to a whole lot of music, and not all of it is rock and roll. Some of it is Broadway stage shows, and others are mm. ballads from years gone by. But Michael Jackson has the rights now mm. to all the Beatles stuff. Mm. How much did it bother you when uh, Revolution was used to sell Nike sneakers and things like that? Heaps. Uh, yeah, you know, it was... Uh, I'll tell you why, you see. With the Beatles, we had all those offers. You know, anybody who publishes songs, you get those offers. Hey, can we use this commercial? We had the offers from the big soft drinks companies. You know who I'm talking about. A big, huge offers to use a Beatles song, to use this and that. But we always turned them down because we believed it would devalue the whole thing. We'd be seen to be selling out, which we were keen not to do. You know, we kind of felt that our fans believed in us and that we owed them some sort of integrity. We, 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 we talked to them. We knew what they thought of us, you know. So something like Revolution, you know, it meant more than a pair of sneakers. So, um, and I think the danger is it does devalue it. And I think even commercially, it's not that great a decision. But uh, anyone who knows music publishing, there's a lot of pressure on you to do that because it's a big heap of cash comes in suddenly and, you know, it's very hard to resist for anyone. But I, I think we shouldn't do that. I don't really think we should do that. I think, uh, I think it's more sensible to leave the kind of legend intact. And I think, they'll, I think they'll do great, the songs. I think they'll continue to do great. And I think to uh, commercialize them like that, um, I think it spoils them. And having taken that decision with the Beatles, um, it's now out of our hands, really. We, c we don't have the authority yeah. anymore to do that because it's now been sold. But I, th I do still think it's a pity. But I've... Uh, I think it's something that we might change, I don't know, in the future. But personally, I also think, as I say, it's not, it doesn't make commercial sense. I think you weaken, 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 you end up with a weak catalogue of songs that are thought of as sneakers, automobiles, Snickers bars, yeah. and stuff, you know. Here's, here's something I just saw on last week's Rolling Stone with uh, Jerry Garcia on the cover. It's obviously John's glasses. Woke up, got out of bed, dragged a comb across my head, found my way downstairs and drank a cup. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, Maxwell House Coffee. Oh boy, don't you love it? Well, never mind, love. <laughs> it's not the first time and it probably won't be the last, but uh, there you go, that's what I mean. Cheap and nasty, I reckon. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think also the other thing, you see, I'm kind of subverting this whole thing by sort of letting Maxwell House know that uh, the composer of this, these lyrics, or actually they happen to be mine, um, doesn't like them being associated with this. And I think in the end, I think they won't like 
getting involved with a song where someone's not happy about it. You know, they'd rather have something clean and simple. Perhaps, I don't know. That's, that's a hope for the future, anyway. Goes without saying that we're appreciative. It was good to meet you. Cheers, thanks a lot. Okay, see you later.